connecting. Good evening and welcome to Bible study again. We're look yes. looking at um, Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 32, the prodigal son's parable. Um, but first we want to have a time of prayer this evening. So and if for those of you who are new who joined us for the first time, we just want to share with you I'm Major Robert Kramer and uh, just go by Rob. And I'm Major Jody Kramer, just Jody. Yep. So if you have a prayer request, um, you can put that in the comments. Um, if we don't see it before we move on tonight, um, we will make sure that we are um, praying for those requests. Absolutely. Over um, throughout the week, we've been praising God for the praises that we received last week um, and praying over those that you commented on um, last week as well. Um, so I know um, we have even better news. We told you last week we had a praise that yes. our roof was being fixed for over our chapel and that the heating units and cooling units, the new ones, would be in this week. And the roof is finished. It's completed. And the units have been not only put on the roof, but they are plugged in and working just fine. So when... We are able to gather together again as a church family. We will be able to worship in our chapel. Amen. So I know we've been waiting for that, looking forward to that. Um, so we're there. So when we get back, we will be able to do that together. I do know that I have a, uh, a family who member who's in need of some real prayer for her son. So I'm not going to share the name, but... Um, her, her son is in need, so if we can just keep her and her family in prayer at this time, our family in general, um, for uh, God to just do a work in this uh, little boy's life. Amen. Um, obviously, there are people that are still worried. The stay-at-home order for Ohio, anyway, has been extended through May 1st. Um, so that's creating some anxiety for people as it regards um, employment, kids out of school, um, and parents who've never had to homeschool before are having to homeschool now. And I know most teachers are being very, very helpful, um, but it can be very difficult as well. So praying for all of those who are going through that. Absolutely. Um, any other prayer requests that you know of? Um, basically just that God would bring a resolution to this uh, virus and uh, show and reveal to the scientists what's needed in order to overcome it. Amen. All right. So am I praying or are you praying? No, you can pray. All right. I'm going to pray. Would you join me? Father God, um, we do give you praise. Um, not just for what you do for us, Lord God, but because you are good. Yes. And you are faithful to us. You are the creator of the universe. Um, each one of us is here because you saw fit to knit us together in our mother's wombs. And you have a purpose and you have a plan for us. Um, and that's ever unfolding. But we know that, that you are leading the way, Lord. And so we give you praise for that. And Father, we do give you praise for the fact that you have um, seen fit to allow during this time for our chapel roof to be replaced and the units to be on so that we will have um, proper heating and cooling in the chapel. And you've just made that possible, Lord, so that when we are able to gather together physically again, Mm -hmm. um, we will be able to be in our chapel. So we just praise you for that, Lord. Um, we do pray for um, the family that Major Rob mentioned. We pray, Lord God, for yes. um, just your hand in it. Lord God, you know the specifics. You know all of the specifics, and you know exactly what the right solution is for them. And so, Lord yes. God, we pray that you would bring that about that you would make your presence known to them, that they would feel your love, yes. that they would feel your presence, your comfort, and your peace surrounding them. And Lord God, 
Um, we just pray for all of us who are affected, our whole nation. In fact, the whole world, yes. Lord God, has been impacted by this, this virus, Lord. It's so much easier when the enemy is able to be seen. But this is, this is an enemy that we can't see. Um, but even though we can't see this enemy, Lord God, we know that you are over even this. And so yes. we pray, Lord God, that that you would give wisdom and knowledge to the scientists and researchers who are looking for um, vaccines, who are, are looking to find, Lord God, um, medicines that will bring about healing from Help this. Them, yes. And we pray, Lord God, for the wisdom and knowledge for them that you would enable them to find that, that right combination of whatever it might be um, to, to assist in the healing of those who are already impacted by this yes. um, and to create a vaccine so that we can prevent this from happening, Lord. Um, even in spite of this, Lord, we, we know that you are with us. We never go through the good times or the bad times alone. You are always with us. So we just we want you to know that we trust you, Lord, and we pray that you will just help us to take encouragement from your Holy Spirit, take encouragement from your word. Mm -hmm. And as we look into your word this evening, Lord, we pray that you will help us to put aside all concerns, all cares, and to just focus on listening for your voice and what you want to share with us this evening through your yes. word. And we pray all of these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, if you have your uh, Bible study notes there, or if you have uh, on your iPad or however you might have the... Uh, lesson there you will see that we're picking up part two of our lesson from last week life learning lessons from the lost and of course this is focusing on the uh, parables that are found in Luke that in particularly deal with losing something very important or valuable mm -hmm. and then how that connects how God sees and views when he sees lost humanity become found and uh, come and find their way uh, back home in fact Tonight, we're going to see and look at the scripture that's very important for us and helps us to realize just how valuable, just how important it is for God to see his lost children return home Amen. and how the church ought to welcome that return of lost uh, children of God. Um, the church should be a welcoming place, not a foreign place for people who are lost to come to and so we just want to begin with the background information that we share from week to week um, as we're focusing on the gospel of luke one of the things to remember is that the hallmark or the uh, heart of the gospel of luke can be found in chapter 4 verses uh, 18 and 19 it's just two simple verses um, but as i shared with you uh, in the prior weeks i just want to read those two scriptures uh, for you or two verses and it's found in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. And that's, of course, what we want to do and what we Amen. believe is happening here to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind mm. and to set the oppressed free. And you may feel that this evening fear and all the worries and apprehensions mm. may make you feel like you're oppressed and you don't know what to do well this is the right place to be because as it says in the word here to proclaim the year of the lord's favor and that's what i want to share with you that we come here as god's children where we find favor in the eyes of god Amen. and uh, it doesn't matter if you're lost it doesn't matter if you've fallen away if you've gone the way of the world or whatever when it comes to god he always welcomes his children back home all you must do is come. Amen. Um, so that leads us to the coming into the first questions. Um, yeah. Actually, one thing that we should note, and I last week we delved into, as I already hinted here, with the uh, two parables that we saw of the lost coin, and then we also saw the one of the lost sheep. Um, this week... And all of those reflected about the kingdom of God and the way that God sees lost humanity. This week, we're going to continue that by 
delving in and exploring the teaching that Jesus did, which is the hallmark of these three parables, um, and that is the parable of the lost son. And so it's with that we're going to um, start with the uh, lesson. All right, so I already know the answer to this question for him, but y'all are going to get a little bit of a story tonight. So first question, um, and hopefully you've gotten the Bible study notes. Um, they are on the Facebook page, yes. but also um, those who have requested that they receive them by email, I did send those out. If you would also like to be emailed the notes ahead of time, we usually get them out on Wednesday. Just um, send us a message or drop your email in the comment section and I'll add you to the list and we can get you those on Wednesday so that you'll, you can print them off or have them available to you in Absolutely. advance. So the first question is, have you ever run away from home? I hate to say it, but I did. Um, at the time I was uh, three or four years old, I'm not sure exactly what it was and uh, going through with some of the uh, questions that are why on did here. you run away why from did home? i run away my mother i was at the grocery store i wanted a candy bar i don't even know what kind of candy bar it was i just wanted a candy bar she told me no <gasps> probably for the good reason of it all yeah she told me no and uh what i ended up doing was i obviously pouted and when she uh, went home i ran away oh i ran away so when you ran away where did you go Good question. I have no clue where I went, but I do know that I was uh, discovered by a cop or by a nice neighbor who basically uh, shared that there's this little boy wandering, wandering around in the neighborhood. And so the police uh, from Niles, Ohio, where I grew up as a kid, they took me to the police station. And of course, they were somehow able to get a hold of my mother and inform her that I was at the police station. Mm -hmm. So what was the conclusion to this little adventure that you went on and traumatized your mother? My oh, goodness. I, I can't even imagine as a father, my daughters <laughs> did this to me, but um, I know that there's a picture my mom has and it shows me and my PJs and it shows me with all kinds of chocolate covering my face and me holding a candy bar. So mm -hmm. while I was at the police station, they provided me a candy bar. So um, hmm. in, in a weird way, I got what I was asking for. Um, I don't remember getting spanked or anything like that from it. Um, I'm sure my mom was worried enough, but, uh, you know, it was definitely, um, uh, a time that ran away for a candy bar. <laughs> hmm. All right. So we're going to look at the scripture, um, Luke chapter 15. Verses 11 through 16, I'm going to read that for you. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to that, read along with us. Um, and then we'll look at the questions pertaining to these specific verses. He also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Mm. So in looking at that section of the passage, what do we learn about the father and the son in the first two verses? What we learn about the father and the son is this. The father, the father honors the son he does. by granting him the request but the son dishonors the father. Mm -hmm. um, during the time of Christ, it would have been incredibly disrespectful for a son to go to his father and make such a request that his father would take the inheritance and give him his portion that was due to him from the estate. Um, those who would have heard Jesus share this parable would have been absolutely shocked um, yes. by such a thing taking place, but they would have been an even greater shock to them would have come by realizing that the father granted the son his mm -hmm. portion of the estate. 
So the next question, what is the younger son's main point in asking for his share of the inheritance? In a simple way of seeing this, what the son was literally saying to the father when he asked for an inheritance so soon was, I wish you were dead or mm. I don't have time for you to die. So give me my part of the inheritance now. Inheritance, as you might know, even today is given generally after the person passes on. Right. Um, not before. Um, someone might give you a little this or a little that, but generally the estate or the inheritance is generally passed on after the person is deceased, your loved one. He doesn't wish to be part of this family anymore. And when he mm -hmm. says this to his father, he's literally making a declaration. I want to be washed my hands of this. I don't want to be about the family business. I want this to be over. Um, those who would hear this prodigal or the, hear about this prodigal son and his horrible, horrible behavior of disrespect would have fully expected that this father would have disowned this boy almost I immediately. Think so, yes. And yet he didn't. Nope. Next question on that same passage. After the son received his share of the estate, what did he do with his newfound wealth? He callously sells off the family estate that he had that was his portion. In fact, it would have been one third of, because in this case, we only know of the two sons. So it would have been one third of this father's total assets, meaning land and all the thing, animals, all that part right. of it. He cashes them in so that he can get the money. The, you know, he, he wanted cash, so to speak. Um, and, and literally in doing so, he would have sold that land, sold that, the, that livestock and whatever else he had. He would have done it all to someone else who was a foreigner, mm -hmm. who was not in the family business, right. um, which would have obviously caused the family to suffer a severe um, loss of income um, and family importance uh, because of such an action. Um, in the Greek... The word for squandered and live while living can be translated that he recklessly spent his money on various meaningless pursuits and immoral behavior. Mm. You and I should not see this as being like the older brother. He spent it on prostitutes and partying. That's not necessarily what it's saying that this son did. It's saying that he spent it on various events and things that he was part of, and he did it. And, and he had behavior that was considered immoral. And what they mean by that is for the Jewish people at that time, there was a belief that you and your inheritance and your wealth and that which belonged to the Jewish people was to be shared within the community. So the best thing would have been for him to have done and conduct a business in Jerusalem or mm -hmm. in the region of Israel, not to go to a foreign land or a foreign country and there spend his father's uh, inheritance, which is what he did. That's what's considered to be he squandered because he took right. the dad's blessing and he passed it on to Gentiles who basically uh, will now use it for whatever the purpose is. So that's in general what's being spoken over here. It'll be similar to you and I today. We hear the made in America and we're encouraged. I remember as a young boy being brought up, you know, if you can buy something, even if you pay a little bit more money, Make sure it says made in America kind of thing. And that's basically what their culture taught is that when you had these blessings, your blessings were meant to be shared within the Jewish community, not outside the Jewish community into the secular society and the secular world, what, what, at they, as they refer to it, the Gentile or the heathen. Right. Right. So then what happened to the son while he was off in that distant country? As he's living... In, in such squanderous ways with the money, meaning he's sowing it and doing maybe business and other things with a foreign country, a severe famine hits that country that mm. he's staying in, this far distant country, and he loses everything he has and he becomes penniless and hungry. And uh, it's in this state when he's penniless and hungry that he's forced to go hire himself out to a foreigner um, and seeking employment and the only employment he's able to find or discover is one that requires him feeding pigs 
and pigs, according to the Jewish people, were considered and are considered to this day an unclean animal, and it was something that you didn't want to be in and or around. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we've been experienced. That here's this young Jewish man who's lost everything. He's now working for a man who owns a pig farm, and right. here he is handling and being around what would be a very unclean animal for his faith. And in essence, he's literally unclean ceremonially. He would not be permitted to okay. enter into the holy places or into the temple area. In fact, he would not even be able to go and be around um, his fellow Jewish people without them basically mm -hmm. saying, you need to get clean before you do this. And there was a ceremony and a practice by which he had to undertake in order to be once again uh, designated as someone clean. Mm -hmm. Desperate. Yes. So where do we find him when we come to the end of verse 16? This is if you look in the scripture there at verse 16, you would discover that he ends up being in a place where he's longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. Mm. And interestingly, no one gave him anything. Here he is. The pigs are able to eat, but he can't. He's not able to eat, he, and he's he's so hungry, so desperate, that he's literally craving what the pigs are eating. It's kind of gross. So this is not just a violation of his faith. It's also now causing him severe physical um, and mental anguish as well. Right. All right, so now looking at verses 17 through 20, which read, When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my hi father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. Wow. That's it's a powerful, not what you expect. Not no. what you expect in this what story. What a powerful image. So what was it exactly that brought the prodigal son to his senses? Um, it was his dire situation. He's in a place where he found himself basically longing and remembering how great his father's house was, right. what his father's servants had versus where he is at this point uh, in time in his life. Um, in fact, there's an old rabbinic uh, proverb which says uh, regarding those who are your children who wander off or who live abroad and who live in, in far places, there's a time when that son or that daughter um, goes abroad and they are barefoot, or in this case, they become desolate, destitute. Then, destitute. then they remember the comfort that they had at home. Um, and, you know, obviously this is one of those things where this son, in his uh, destitute, in his desperate situation, he's finding himself longing and remembering how good it was to be at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of us can probably count a time in our life where maybe we look back and we thought about, Man, I had it so good when I was at home. You know, I had meal, I had a warm bed, I had, you know, no worries, at least no real worries. Um, adulthood wakes us up. It does. You know, we realize all of a sudden when we're taking care of us and others and that kind of stuff, it's it's a big responsibility. And there are times where you long to say, boy, it'd be nice to kind of be at home and not have to worry about anything because mom and dad are taking care of everything. Mm -hmm. um, this is what's happening with this uh, son. He's... He's remembering how good his father is in a sense of the way he cares for his hired servants. And here's this man who's, you know, this boy who's working in for this man who can't even recognize his labor and offer him any food, but instead lets him stay there and basically starve while right. he's feeding his pigs. So in thinking about back over that and look, remembering how his father treated his hired men, um, what do we find from the scripture about um, exactly how the father's 
treated those hired men, especially in regard to their nutrition, because obviously he's hungry. So this is one of the things that he's thinking about how well his father's hired men have it. And that's what it, in the scriptures it shares when he speaks about his father um, and how he treated him. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Mm -hmm. In other words, they got leftovers. And here I am starving to death. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. He was wasting away. He was starving to death while he's remembering how good his father really truly was to those who worked for him. That not only did he make sure that they ate, but he made sure that they had more than enough. Um, and so this is, this is where we see this playing uh, in, in impact of him remembering his father in such good, loving way. Mm-hmm. So all of this thinking back and remembering about how his father treated his hired men and everything caused the prodigal son to make a decision regarding his situation. What decision did he make? Well, you see in 18 and 19, the uh, son basically says, I will go back to my father and say to him, and then listen to these words that he says that he's going to be saying to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Mm. He recognizes his, his heir. He recognizes his sin, um, both to God and also to uh, his father. And uh, his desire is not to go back and be a son. His desire is to go back and be a hired servant because he doesn't feel worthy to be that right. son any longer. Mm -hmm. Well, and you kind of answered the question already about what does he plan on saying to his father. So we've kind of covered that one already. So what realization comes to this son regarding his actions? He realizes his actions were both sinful to God right. and sinful to his father. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the keys to any reconciliation because this this particular parable deals a lot with the necessity of humanity reconciling with God. Right. And part of that is us coming to a place where we recognize, where we see that we have not done well or we have made poor decisions or bad decisions or we have lived sinfully. And it's coming to God and saying, God, I've, I've first and foremost sinned against you, but right. then I also sinned against uh, those to whom I directly were impacted. And in fact, we see this in David. If you remember the story of King David uh, with Bathsheba, when he sinned, I mean, he comes in that one confession, and his thing is, is I've sinned to you, God, and to you alone. Right. It's not that he's not saying there's not people I've not hurt. He clearly recognizes that. But he realizes that ultimately anything wrong I do to another, I've done to God. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important for us to realize when we have wronged somebody, we've actually wronged God first because God's in that God's made that person in his image mm -hmm. and that person bears who God is. And by you treating that person in a wrong way, a harmful way, sinful way, you've actually done that in, in like to God. And so you obviously when you've sinned, the first person you should go to um, is God because he's the one that you've sinned against. Mm. and then go to the person to whom you directly sinned against in the sense of uh, the person that was impacted by what you did. So in thinking back about how his father treated his hired men, acknowledging um, his own part and his sinful behavior and everything, he comes to a decision to do something about it. What does he do about it? Yeah, this is one where you don't want to miss um, where it speaks and it says he got up and went to his father hmm. there are two particular actions that are taking place one is moved by himself he gets up physically gets up from his position and he goes to his father there are so many people who want to just kind of stay back in the place where they're at he didn't talk about it he acted and I think there's times when it comes to our reconciliation with God and with others it requires us getting up and going to that person to whom we have wronged mm -hmm. and asking for forgiveness and, and, and seeking uh, to make the reconciliation. And this, this son understood that. He could have stayed there in that pig pen 
and he could have stayed there being hungry and wishing and thinking how great it was to be at his father's place and what could happen. He could have talked all about how he could say this or do this, but until he got up and went, none of it would have happened. Nice. His actions brought about, just like his actions led him there, his actions are now leading him back to the father. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look now at the second part of verse 20. Are we starting with, but while the sun? Mm -hmm. But while the sun was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. Mm. So from that example of the father and his actions, what do we learn about that father? That father loved, mm -hmm. loved, and longed to see his son return home. Um, we also learned that this father had great sight or vision, uh, great expectation, because what does it say? He saw him long way off. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't wait until he saw the kid knocking on the door. He was looking daily for this kid. This is how the scriptures portray this. We don't know how long he had to wait for this kid mm -hmm. to get to his come to his senses, as we're going to discover later. But he longed, he looked for his son on a regular basis. And I can only imagine that every time he looked out the window, any time he stood on his porch, he was looking in the roadway, hoping to see his son uh, heading down and coming this way. So uh, this is what we see. This is a man who absolutely was delighted and wanted to protect his son and wanted to save his son. Amen. So why do you suppose that the father runs to greet his lost son? In that day and in that culture, um, the community raised also um, your children. It was obviously, mm -hmm. it, was, it was within the household they did, but the community has shared in that. And so when this boy did what he did to his father, he brought great shame on his father, he but he also brought shame on that community. And so when that community, if they would have saw this boy uh, returning home, they would have felt like they were doing that father a favor by beating him or chasing him off or even killing him for what he had done. Um, what's interesting is the father's action when he sees his son afar off. And it shows his deep love for his son and that he runs to him. Now, that seems like not a big deal to you and I because... You know, right. we may run to someone because, hey, you know, we're happy to see him. But in that day and in that culture, a man of his distinguished as he, this father would have been, he would not have run. Mm -hmm. It was very undignified for a man to do such a thing. In fact, it was humiliating for a man to have to run because if you remember the garments that they wore, he would have had to pick up somewhat his uh, outer cloak and, and garments and hold them close so that he could run to his son. Right. And in so doing, he's showing and exposing, obviously, his legs, which to us may not seem like a big deal because mm -hmm. we wear shorts, but it was a big deal in that day and in that culture. Right. And so this father ran to protect his prodigal son because he knew if the neighbors got him, if the community got hold of him, it was probably not going to be a good story for that son. Right. And so the father ran first and foremost because he loved him and he longed for him to return. But mm. second, he ran to him because he wanted to protect him and shield him from the harm that could have come his way because of his disrespect to his father. Mm -hmm. So how do you think this prodigal son would have felt by his father's compassionate embrace of him? Well, knowing that he had shared earlier that he was in his uh, plea, hey, make me one of your hired servants. His only desire, he didn't expect to be treated well. Right. He only expected, hey, dad, if possible, can you let me work for you? Um, and that was his greatest uh, thoughts of possibility. He thought maybe even perhaps this was going to be the end of him, but he felt like he had no choice. Mm -hmm. He would probably rather died than he kept on living with those pigs, not being able to eat. Um, but so he would have been cr incredibly shocked by the reality of his father's grace, mm -hmm. his father's love, and his father's forgiveness as he lavished compassion and love upon him and that warm embrace. So I think uh, the, 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 the son would have just been 
speechless by what the father was doing. Mm -hmm. So how does this mirror our heavenly father then? It mirrors the length by which our father goes to try to save and redeem and bring home his lost children. Um, just as that father waited on that porch, just as that father longed to see that son coming down the roadway, our father longs to see us. And Amen. he looks for the slightest signs for us to simply say, God, I want to come home. Amen. And when we're ready to do that, he's there with open arms. He's not there to judge us, criticize us, or, or tell us how bad we were. He's there to receive us and to welcome us home. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing. Think of the scriptures that we probably grew up knowing, most of us. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he be, gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It speaks of God's love Amen. and the length by which God and the depth by which God would show that love in redeeming humanity. But also, just as this father humiliated himself, we discover God humiliated himself mm -hmm. in order to, by becoming like us, one of us, in order that he may bring us home. We find this in Philippians 2 8, where it says, And being found in the appearance of man, mm -hmm. he humbled himself. And became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so it speaks of, here is God. God chooses to take on our flesh in order that he may be able to bring and draw us back home. Mm. Just like this father humiliated himself, humbled himself in order to uh, save his son and keep his son from harm. Our God has also, our God, our father has also gone out of his way in order to bring us to the point of uh, salvation and bring us to the place mm -hmm. where we can come home and be with him. Amen. So now we're going to look at verses 21 through 32. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead Amen. and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him? Son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. So what does the lost son try to tell his father? He tries to share with him as he had already planned and scripted. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And of course, you remember, there's a, the latter part that he was going to share. Make me like one of your hired servants. Except he doesn't get a chance to finish that. Because his father has already clung to him, lavishing him with love. And, and it, it causes him to literally cease there. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And that's where it leaves his sentence uh, being. Mm -hmm. And how does the father respond to his son's confession? The father summons the servants to say to him, as it says there in the scriptures, quick, quickly. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this, this son of mine was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. Mm. So vest, robe, the ring, sandals, um, doesn't really translate into our time, something that we would think is very significant. But obviously it's significant for the father to do that. So what Absolutely. is the significance in in bringing the best robe, the ring, and putting sandals on his feet. This all signifies that the father, by his response, is reinstating this lost son back into the family. In fact, he's doing so in such a way that he's saying all the rights, all the privileges, mm -hmm. and all the authority belongs to this son, just as it does to his other son and to himself as the father. In fact, the best robe more than likely signifies that it was the father's robe itself because he was the mm -hmm. one who was the head of the family. So he's the one that would have obviously the best uh, robe. And it signified the honor and the authority that the father possessed. Um, the ring signifies membership and authority within this family. And of course the sandals, and it's not something that you and I would think that much about today, but sandals were worn by those who were typically the family members. Those who were servants would often go barefoot and or have some other form of cloth or something else that they would wear. So sandals were, were a, a, a status symbol and it was something that was worn by the immediate family. The fattened calf, which initially just seems like there's gonna be a cookout. Hey, you know, let's go have a barbecue. In this time, <laughs> The fattened calf signifies the father's desire that his son not just be reconciled because the reconciliation with the father has already happened. You know, the father's already received him, already granted forgiveness. But the father wants the son to be reconciled to the community. And so by having this fattened calf be uh, mm -hmm. provided as a meal, he would have invited the community to come and join in this feast of his son's return but in the same time to reconcile back with this son as well uh, that, and to the community so that he was no longer would be labeled as the wicked son or the prodigal son, but he would now be seen as the son. So mm -hmm. the father was doing this so that there would be community recon reconciliation with the son. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a restoration Absolutely. of the son into the family and a reconciliation with not only the father, but what the community, the community as well it was really twofold so why does the father want to throw a feast because his lost son has returned home amen how does the older brother respond to his lost brother's return and what do we learn about him upon discovery of his brother's return his lost brother and the feast being thrown in his honor of his return the older brother becomes incredibly angry he and does. he refuses to go into the feast. Now, we see a turn of events unfold here, remembering how the son was disrespectful and the things that unfolded with him with regarding his father asking for the inheritance. We now discover that this older son is disrespectful. Now, according to the Middle Eastern custom of the, in that during this time, the older son should have been the key agent in bringing about the reconciliation between the father and the son, the youngest son. But we see in this story, this father so desperately loves his son, his younger son, who's lost. Not that he doesn't love the older son, because he does, and we're going to see that. But he so much loves his children that he goes out of his way, and he breaks custom mm -hmm. in order to reconcile and bring that son home. In other words, he's saying, I don't need someone to stand between me and you being reconciled. I'll reconcile with you, and, and I'll do it by your simple turning and coming to me. Um, so that's the first thing. But also, we should understand that this eldest son's refusal to go in, he disrespected his father mm -hmm. because he, he could have privately pulled his father aside, talked to him and told him, hey, this isn't right. But he does it in view of those who are there. And so everyone who's hearing it. And so in a way, he insults his father in front of his community. Because remember, the community has come to f do this feast right. of this reconciliation. And here's this father who's trying to reconcile all his family and community 
And here's this older son refusing to be reconciled to his brother. And in so doing, he separates. In fact, the lost son who's now found, you now have the older son who's always been there and never ran away, becomes lost mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is the older son's beef with his father throwing a feast for the younger son, the lost, who has come back? At the heart of what bothers this son, and on some level you and I might identify with this, um, he has given everything he has to his father. He's always been there, always worked, always done everything. He didn't run away. He didn't spend money carelessly and that kind of stuff. And he feels that on some level he's worked like a dog and his father hasn't done anything special for him. At least that's what he perceives. Now what's interesting is if you read this, his eyes were on himself. Mm. In his desire to be with his friends. He misses at the heart of this what mattered to the father. The father cared about the family's relationship. Right. And we see that because later on the father says in 31, you're always with me. To the father, the relationship is what matters. To the son, it's what he gets. Hmm. It's what he receives. It's what he wants. He's in many ways no different than his younger brother. Right. The only difference is, is he didn't run away, but in his heart, he ran away. He just stayed home and waited to be and longed to be with those outside the family. Mm. And so this is what we discover. The other thing that we notice in here is that the older son doesn't call his father father. He simply says to him, look, mm. he's disrespectful. And in that day and in that age, your father, your right. mother, and or someone who was significant statue in the community was referred to by their given title or by their given mm -hmm. purpose for which they were. This son, older son, uh, disrespected his father, not just by not going into the party, to the feast, but he also disrespected him when he dressed him. He didn't address him as his mm -hmm. father. Remember the younger son, when he came home, what did he say? Father, I have sinned. Here's the older son, and he doesn't even address his father as father. Mm -hmm. Just look, and he goes right at his father, almost in an attack. And yet the father does not respond in kind, but rather gives comfort and assurance to the oldest son. So what did exactly that comfort and assurance look like? Um, and did it work to, to kind of smooth the ruffled feathers of the oldest son? Yeah, the father says to him, and, and I just shared that with you, you are always with me, the relationship, and everything I have is yours. Mm. Remember when the father split, it, he gave both. To both of his sons, to the one son who took his part, sold it off, and then went the younger, but to the older one at this point, everything was his. In other words, this fattened mm -hmm. calf that was offered could have been done by his son anytime his son wanted it. Right. He didn't have to wait for his father, mm -hmm. but in this situation, he's working and laboring. He, in many ways, sees himself as just a laborer. He never really realizes that you're a son and you're with mm -hmm. me and you have the fellowship with me. And that's what the father wanted more than anything right. was the relationship with his older son. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't and it, really work. Sadly, it didn't work. <laughs> no. So what is the lesson that Jesus is trying to share with us here regarding the kingdom of God um, and about family reconciliation? One of the things that's important, and I wrote this down but forgot to put this in the notes, in this parable, we discover the son didn't want to wait for his father to die so that he can inherit his portion because he wanted to live. Right. He couldn't wait for his father to die because he wanted to live. Mm. What the son ends up discovering, however, is that the son who was trying to live ends up finding himself dead in the sense that 
He's wasting away. Mm -hmm. He's literally at his end. And the only thing that's able to sustain him and give him life is the memory that his father is good. And when he goes to his father, he receives love, forgiveness, mm -hmm. and life into the community and into the family again. And so I think that's really important to, to know because I believe that has a connection with God. We sometimes think we can have a better life or we can do better if we just throw God aside. But ultimately, we need God to live. We need God. If you really want to live, you want to live in Christ and you want to live in God. So this father longs, and what we see in this parable is that God our Father longs for his lost sheep, his lost children, that lost coin, whatever it might be, but in particularly the lost child mm. to come home, to return home, where he's not there filled with criticism and judgment and condemnation. He's sitting there with love. And in fact, the moment he sees you ready to return, he runs to greet you and to love you and to welcome you into the family again. This is a celebration of the returning child back to the kingdom of God. Amen. And for the church, we're like that older brother. And we have to decide when our brother returns, are we with the father? In other words, do we have the father's heart? That father's heart was always for his kids, hmm. both the younger and the older. Both of them lost focus of their father's heart. That's but it. when the younger remembered that father's mm -hmm. heart, it brought him home. Amen. Sadly for the older one, the story is left. We don't know. And the story doesn't conclude what ultimately happens to that boy, that older son. Because I believe God leaves it in our hands to make that decision. What will we do mm -hmm. as the children of God who have been saved, redeemed, and brought into the family of Christ? How do we respond when that man or woman who comes from a very notorious or or bad past how do we respond to them mm. do we have the father's heart to look at them to welcome them in and accept them or do we like the that older son i've been working i've been doing this all the time and why don't you help me or why don't you give me something mm. when god's saying all that i have is yours right and you're with me isn't that the greatest gift that any of us could receive is to be in the presence of God Almighty mm -hmm. and to be about his business. That's what gave Jesus the greatest pleasure. Mm -hmm. And it should also then give us the greatest pleasure. And if that's the point that God's heart is in his lost children coming home, it should be ours as well. Amen. So then our last question is really the application for all of us. Um, so the question, first question to think about is, where do you see yourself in this biblical account of the lost son? And these are ones that we can answer personally because they do apply to us each individually. Um, where do you see yourself in this story? Are you the prodigal son mm. or are you the older son? Um, and then maybe ask God to help you in that so that you can become like that son who returned home with the right heart and right attitude mm -hmm. and receive the love from your father. And this is a, a pretty familiar story, I think, for a lot of us. Um, so as we've kind of gone through it, and not just reading the story, but digging a little deeper into it, um, how has this story maybe changed your view and your perceptions about God the Father? Has that changed at all as we've, we've dug a little deeper into this? And then lastly, thinking about how this teaching should be implemented within the body of Christ known as the church. We are the church. Amen. It's not a building. It's all of us. Um, when Christ takes up residence in our lives, we become the temple of God, and our temple is mobile, so Amen. it's not based on a building. It's us. Everywhere we go, we take Christ with us as the temple. So just be thinking about um, those three questions. Where do you see yourself in this biblical account of the lost son? 
Has this story changed your view and perceptions about God the Father? And if so, how? And then how can this teaching be implemented within the body of Christ known as the church? So take these words, take this teaching that we are given by uh, Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, apply them to your life, and uh, may we be that older brother for those of us who are saved that receive those who are coming back like our father with a welcoming heart that is glad that that brother or sister is returned. And if we happen to be, or you happen to be that person out there who is that prodigal still running away, just know that the father's waiting and he's longing for you to come home. He's waiting. And he's waiting with love and with a warm embrace and to bring you back into the family. He wants to restore you. He wants to reconcile you with himself and with his people. So God bless. Enjoy the rest of your week and live for Jesus. Amen. Join us on Sunday morning, 1030 a.m. for worship.